the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, um, this morning we're going to be reading out of the book of Philippians. So I'm going to ask you if you could grab your Bibles, remain standing with me um, in reverence to God's word. To Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And as you're turning there, amen, uh, I want to do something special here today, amen. And so God's put this on my heart early this morning, amen. And so uh, I want to do something a little special right now. Uh, well, for one, I want to make mention, I know some of you guys already know that my dad is here visiting with us there from all the way from Oxnard, California, amen. And so what I want to do is I want him to come up here and just share a word of greetings to you guys. Is that all right? Praise the Lord. You want to come up here, Dad, and say a word of greetings? He speaks English, so he don't need an interpreter, amen. God bless you, everyone. I'm shaking. No, not really. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to see all your faces. And the word I have uh, for you guys is to encourage the team that I saw yesterday work so hard uh, in, in this building to create God's temple, God's uh, sanctuary. I'm happy for you guys. And uh, I have in my heart to bring you a little gift next Saturday before I leave Utah. So come on. Come on, somebody. We can do it together, right? God bless you. And one more thing. I have a verse in the Holy Bible that uh, come to my mind many times. On uh, John. John chapter 17, verse 3. Where it says, go ahead and read it. Because this I have it in my mind often. It comes to me. But it says something like this. And this is, this is, you find out. <laughs> you find out. But this verse is very touched me. I shared this with my son. I shared this. Okay. This is the verse, the chapter 17, verse 3. And this is the life eternal. Que te conozcan a ti, Padre, el único Dios del universo. Y a tu Hijo amado, a quien tú enviaste. Esta es la vida eterna. Pensemos en qué es o quién es la vida eterna. Porque está aquí. Amén. Aleluya. Praise the Lord. Amén. Um, you know, I've shared with you guys a number of things in pertaining to my father. And, um, and you know, a, a, a testimony isn't complete until you see God's redemptive hand at work. And God, when God saved me, I was the worst one out of all my family, right? And the first one to get saved. God used the worst to save the rest. Can I get a witness at God's house? Right? He did the same thing for my brother-in-law, amen? Right? But, uh, um... But since salvation, uh, after I got saved, my dad shortly, a few years later, he got saved, amen. And since then, God has been building a relationship among us too, amen. Uh, it, it's been a little rocky, can I be real, right? But we've been able, like two mature believers, to come together and understand the harm we've done on one another. And then allow God's redemptive hand to come in and bring in forgiveness and then build something new. And so me and my father, we're building something new now, amen. We're building a relationship, first of all, under the Lord, amen. Second of all, as two grown men, amen. And so I just wanted to share that with you guys. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible reads this. It says, finally, believers. So who's he talking to today? Talking to every believer. Now, if you're here today and you're saying, I don't know what I believe. Well, today I believe that you're going to leave this place no, having the opportunity to choose to believe in Jesus the Christ, amen? Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, I'm reading the Amplified Version, whatever is right and confirmed, because how many know that there's a lot of things that say they're right, but they ain't confirmed by God's word? Whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, 
if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think, somebody say think, continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may go ahead and be seated today. Thank you, son. This morning, I'm going to be preaching on a topic in regards to atmosphere. Somebody say atmosphere. Now, we know what an atmosphere is, right? But before I go and describe what an atmosphere is, I want to first get into, I just want to get into the context of this sermon. Now, this is a beautiful, a beautiful portion of scripture because unlike Paul's other letters that we, and we know that the letter of the Philippians was a letter that was written by Paul while he was in prison. Now, I think, I, I might not be 100% sure, but I think that some of us, not a lot of us, but some of us can relate to receiving a letter from someone in prison. Like I said, just a few, just probably one or two, right? The rest, you guys were in prison writing the letters. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. The author of this letter we know is Paul. Writing this letter from prison is this letter is not this letter is a different and a very distinct letter, or what, what is also called as a an epistle. And every letter, somebody say every letter has a purpose. Would you agree? I mean, yeah, you know, essentially it's to connect, but every letter is with a purpose. In other words, it has an end in mind. We can call this, or as you get familiar with writing papers, those of you guys who are going to be taking Bethy, oh yeah, by the way, I want to make mention that I passed the teacher's, the instructor's training course, amen? I, I'm not going to lie, I passed by the hairs of my chinny chin chin, amen? But hey, you know what they say? What, what, what was it that they say? Uh, uh, win, win, uh, win by an inch or a mile, winning is winning. Praise the Lord. And I'm pretty sure I just quoted Fast and the Furious, but it's all right. So the theme of this letter, but as you get, as you be, get familiar with writing papers, you begin, to dis, you begin to describe what you want to communicate and make it evident. This is known as the end in mind. Now, the theme of this letter that Paul was communicating to the, to the church of Philippi was how to live in the ultimate joy in living for Christ. Somebody say, the ultimate joy in living for Christ. Because now, you, just like myself, we can come to discover that even though we are in a joyful setting, it doesn't mean that internally we're joyful. Can I, get a, can I get a witness in God's house? You can be at a festive event but feel, but, and, and around a lot of people, but feel very lonely and disconnected. How many know what I'm talking about here today? So Paul is, Paul's theme of this letter is ultimate joy in living for Christ. A theme is a subject in a sermon, a speech, or a written paper. And we know that Paul was an intellectual. In other words, Paul was an educated man. He was articulate. And everything the Lord inspired him to write was always with an end in mind. Paul was a man who wasted no time. His end in mind was for the believers in Philippi at large. For the believers of Philippi and the believers at large. Was that they would live in the ultimate joy in living for Christ. Now, do, would you agree with me here today that there is joy in living for Christ? Okay. Would you agree with me that it was pleasing for a season living a certain lifestyle? And, and it's almost like a bait and switch tactic. It feels good in the beginning, but then it becomes tormenting. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? And so whatever it is that we're involved in has a tendency of becoming what we are living for. Before I came to Christ, I was living for drugs. Oh, yeah, like I'm the only one here today. I mean, I, I, I want to say, like, I want to be like that guy that just be like, y'all was living for a gang, eh? 
But it, it started that way. But then all we became was just junkies. And then we were just a gang representing a neighborhood all getting high together. Am I the only one? Does that happen here too? Must be the same devil. See, I was living with a I was living for a purpose, but that purpose was not my own. That purpose was not of my choosing, right? The enemy chose it for me. Why? Because I was yoked into generational curses. Curses that have been passed down from generation to generation. And as I got, when I got saved, and I, dis- and I found what my dad was talking about in John 17, 3. The Bible says that eternal life is to know God. See, I didn't know that God wanted anything to do with me. Just like some of you here today, you may feel, I don't feel like God wants anything to do with you. Well, I'll give you the evidence that he does, that, that somehow, some way, you found your way to get to the house of the Lord, to hear nothing less than his word, to experience his presence. And I'll tell you why that is, because God wants to step you in to his ultimate joy and teach you that you don't have to live, you don't have to to live depressed you don't have to live in addictions you don't have to live in anxieties you don't have to live suicidal you don't have to live bound by drugs you don't have to live an alcoholic you don't have to live a violent gang life oh but you can live a life of freedom a life of fulfillment a life of joy And that is only found in Jesus Christ. Now you may say, well, how do you know that that is only found in Jesus Christ? Well, let's do a small assessment. Before I came to Christ, now, just give me an amen if you've been there, okay? So I'm going to share my personal story. And if you like, you're like, yeah, I did that too. You could give me an amen. Are we good? Okay, let's go. Before I came to Christ, there were days, and they were many, that it just got old. All right, we're on the same page. It just got old. There were moments and days where I was tired of that life. Then there were moments and days that I'm like, man, I want something different. There were times where I would watch movies. Commercials. Heck, I'd even just be walking down the street in, or in a supermarket. And I'd see a couple with their children. And it looked like something out of a movie. They were like all smiles. And they were playing with their kids and interacting. And the kids were respectful. And, and I'd look at that. And it made me angry. Why? Because I had lost my family. Because of the lifestyle choices that I had made. But there was a moment where I would look at that and I would tell myself, I wish that I could have that. How many have ever been there before? Or there were moments when finally the the modern day ghostbusters, I call the police officers the ghostbusters, amen, or the detectives, whoever happened to get me first, amen, when finally they would gaffle me up. And they would put me in the back of the cop car. I did everything to prevent from them catching me. How many hours did that? Right? Hey, it was catch me if you can. Come on, somebody, right? But then when they would finally catch me and put me in the back of the cop car and I'm sitting there handcuffed, I would oftentimes be like, finally I'm going to get some sleep. Am I the only one? Like, it's almost as if the cells provide a little bit of comfort. Am I the only one? Or you guys are like, I'm like really, I'm talking about the women. The women here have done more time than the men. It's crazy, huh? No, I'm just playing, man. Right? And so, but I tried things. I said, all right, I'm going to exercise more. How many did that? How many feel they should do that right now? Nah, I'm just saying, amen. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to get into 
fitness, and I'm going to be a fitness influencer. Come on, somebody. Right? You tried that. I tried that. And what happened? I still found myself doing what I didn't want to do. I told myself, now I'm healthy. Man, I can't go get high. It's going to mess up my regimen. It's going to steal my gains. Come on, somebody. Like, I'm serious. I would talk like that. Amen. When I got into fitness, I got into fitness. Amen. Right? There's something I was born with, or I wasn't born with. I wasn't born with a halfway button. Anybody else? Like, I'm extreme. I'm either extremely good or I'm extremely bad. I don't have no in-between, right? So whatever I did do, I did it to the extreme, amen? Except I wouldn't wear no headbands on my head or looking like Jane Fonda. I wouldn't do that. Or I wouldn't look like Richard Simmons, okay? You know how we do it. We make it look cool, right? So I got involved in all that, and, and, and ne next thing you know, opportunity arose, right? And what happened, right? In Fresh out of the gym, in my fitness clothes, I'd go and connect with somebody that I knew had access to what my flesh desired, and I had no control over it. And usually that meant I would go to Jesse's house. True story. And there I go, and I'm like, okay, I just got to get back on track. I used already. I messed up. I got to get back on track. I know it's going to take me like three days to get over it. I just got to sleep a little bit. I just got to eat better. I just need some, 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 some good protein shakes. Anybody ever done that? I just need to drink plenty of milk. I just need to drink a lot of water and walk real slow. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody else that's ever done that? I'm so glad that I'm not the only weird one, amen? All right. Amen, right? I tried something and it didn't work. Then I would, I would find myself before long, right, you go over there and you mess with the snake's tail. You start chipping a little bit. You start messing around a little bit. And before you know it, that dang snake bites you and they ain't letting go. Now you're full-fledged. First it was one day. Next day it's three days. Next day it's all week. Next time you don't even go to work. But you tell your wife you're going to work. Come on. Am I the only one? Or you tell whoever you're living with, hey, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to work, man. Right? You even dress up in work clothes. Like, you were working for Walgreens, so you, wa you wear a Walgreens. You're like, I'm going to work right now. <laughs> you wouldn't sleep all day, and they would see you ironing first thing in the morning. Like, did you even sleep? Yeah, I'm going to work right now. I'm getting, <laughs> come on, somebody, right? It didn't work. We end up right back where we, end, where we didn't want to be. And then we're, 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 what usually stops it for us? The county jail. We end up in the county jail, and we're saying the same old things, man. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just listened. And then there comes that sobering, those sobering thoughts. Maybe this is just the way I am. We try AA. How many tried AA before? Not knocking AA. My dad's been in AA for 30 plus years, right? It got him to be sober, but now he uses it as a fishing pool, right? Because since he's got saved, he's gotten educated, he's a part of a sound doctrine, Spanish ministry, and uh, what he used to do before propagating AA, he uses it, amen, to bring the message of the gospel. That's called infiltrating the world systems, right? Not knocking it, but it didn't work for me. Did it work for anyone else? Okay, how many have ever tried it, though? Say amen. Tried Narcotics Anonymous. I tried recovery programs. Anybody ever gone to a, re a recovery program? Right? You know that here in Utah, the recovery programs at large, all the way from Tremont all the way down to St. George, entire Utah, every single, sing every single secular recovery program has a 1% to 5% success rate Upon completion, completing their program. One to five percent. Now they charge either the federal government or they charge individuals, but because most drug addicts don't have money, guess who pays for it? They're the people who love them. And so the people who love them are exploited by their love. And they're paying anywhere from eighteen to forty thousand dollars a month to have their loved one there, or the federal government. In other words, our hardworking tax dollars pay for these recovery places. 
with a turnaround rate, with a success rate of 1% to 5%. And we wonder why it doesn't work for us. Are you following me here today? So we've tried many things. But the question is, have you tried Jesus Christ? Jesus is the only one that can help you in your situation. Let me put it to you in simple terms. What goes on in our life, if your life is similar to mine, or if you find yourself in a different type of lifestyle, maybe it's not drug addiction. Maybe it's, maybe it's you're, ad you're addicted to pleasure. Maybe you're addicted to money. Maybe you're addicted to people. Oh, it's awfully quiet up in here, right? You, like, are in love with being in love. Break up to make up type of stuff. Hello. Nevertheless, there's a bondage in our life. So this message is not exclusively for, exclusively for drug addiction. Because sin has many avenues. And they all lead to the same thing, bondage. They all lead to being bound. Well, what does that mean? It means just like when you're bound on your way to court, you're shackled head to toe. You're shackled from your, from your, from your wrist all the way down to your ankles, so your walking is limited. You know the walk, right? I don't know what I'm talking about. Depending on where you go, right, you're like this, right? Do you remember that? Okay. Now... You're restricted as to what you can do. If you decide you want to, if you're driving by, or if you're like, you know, depending on where you are, like, depending on where you are, like when we were being, we had two county jails in my county. So if you were in the other county jail that they call Todd Road, they would transfer you from Todd Road all the way to the main jail, right, for you to go to the main, to the main court, to the, to the superior court there. And so on the way there, you've seen a lot of restaurants, you've seen McDonald's, and for some reason, McDonald's is so appealing in the county jail. You see Carl's Jr., you see little taco stands, you see different things going on. And if you decide, you know what, man, I want to stop and go get me a burrito or something, right? You can't do it. Well, you see, it's the same way when there is a bondage in our life, when there are addictions or there are vices or there is sin in our life that has us bound. We want to be better people. We want to do better things, but we just can't help ourselves. Somebody asked me why. Because it's not physical, it's spiritual. Because what's behind it is the devil, his evil spirits, his fallen angels and demons. They bind our life, they have legal rights. It's almost, it's similar to a jailer being around you, walking you from place to place uh, as you're going from captivity to captivity, from cell to cell, and you're shackled down. And that person, that, that demon's job or that evil spirit's job is to keep you captive uh, and not let you go. So even if you try, even if you desire, even if you want it to stop, even if you want it to change, uh, you couldn't do it because there was something spiritual that had you captive until you met the Lord Jesus the Christ and Jesus comes in like a warrior God as a warrior God and destroys every work of Satan within our lives is that not what the Bible says right the Bible says Jesus was revealed to destroy every work of Satan first John 3 8 to destroy every work of Satan within our lives. So here Paul is communicating, getting us to understand that the reason why we ought to be joyful is because Jesus himself, God himself, entered our life. Right? I mean, that's the greatest escape story. Houdini ain't got nothing on Jesus. Because, see, Jesus didn't cause you to slip away. 
Jesus came in like a roaring lion uh, and devoured the enemy in your life uh, and got him running like a group uh, of hyenas uh, and said, come here, son. Come here, daughter. You don't got to live like that no more. You are now stepping into my joy. You are now stepping in to life uh, and life more in abundance. He's describing to them. This is now what you have. And today I need to let you know, this is what you have an opportunity to experience right now. Maybe you've tried different things. Maybe you've tried some of the things that I've shared. Maybe like me, you went to a psychologist and you were really truthful with what what was going on inside you. Oh, I was really truthful to what was going on inside me. And they had to send me to a specialist. I'm like, that's pretty bad when the shrink has to send you to a shrink of the mother specialist, right? I mean, I just, I could see the look in her eyes, and I could see, like, there was terror, like, oh, my God, we got a live one. Come on, somebody. I was just trying to heal. I was just trying to get better. I'm like, okay, I've never done this. I remember one time I went to a Catholic priest. I'm like, all right, you know what? All right, God, I'm going to go to you, and the only way I knew the only thing I knew was to go to a Catholic priest. So I went to the Catholic, I'm, I'm sharing two stories. So I go to the Catholic priest. I'm sucked up as could be. The reason why I need to, I, I need to, I tell you that is because I carried guns when I was in the world. Sometimes they were big guns. And because I was so skinny, anything that I would put on my waist would bulge out. So... There I am walking into the priest thinking, okay, he, maybe he's not going to trip. And I'm walking in, he's looking at me, he's all weird. And I'm like, I need to talk to you, man. I need to get right with God. And so he sat down, he's like, okay, what's going on? I think he didn't feel like he had an option. And I just started dumping it all on him. Man, I've done this and I've done that. As a matter of fact, the other day I did this and I did that. Man, and then this and that. And man, I just want forgiveness. What do you say? He looked at me like, oh, my God. He looked at me like, if I tell this guy the wrong thing, he just might, right? And he goes, wow, you know, uh, I could tell he was afraid. He goes, wow, you know what, um, you know, God forgives us all, and maybe he will forgive you. And he gave me a, a bunch of little prayers and, and to, to say, and we call it penance, right? And I'm not knocking on it. I'm just sharing my experience. And so, but I remember looking at him and feeling the vibe in his life. And I remember, I remember sensing that he did not believe that change could come into my life. So I left discouraged and mad. Right? But then here comes, but Jesus was still looking for me. He was still calling me like he was calling Adam in the, in the Garden of Eden. Even after he sinned, even after he disobeyed God, even after he rebelled and he ate the forbidden fruit, God was still looking for the man. God was still searching for the sinner. God is still searching for the sinner today. God is still searching for the man or the woman that doesn't feel like they are in right standings with him. He is still searching for them. And he is still calling them. And so because you're here, I need you to know that it's because God has been calling you. uh, And if you've tried everything uh, and nothing has worked, uh, I would ask of you. uh, I would would advise you today uh, to give Jesus the Christ the try. uh, Not religious Jesus. uh, Not the Jesus of man. uh, Not the Jesus of color but the Jesus of the Bible the one that went into the highways and went into the byways Jesus of Nazareth I like how they call him Jesus of Nazareth because I think we could relate come on somebody it's almost like saying Jesus from the east side he can huh he was Jesus of Nazareth right it was almost like, hey, it's cool. Like, that's why we like to say where we're from. Come on. Why are you lying right now? Right? Man, you know, Jazz is proud of where he's from. He's so proud he got it blasted on his head. Huh? 
That's pride. That's like, man, I'm proud of where I'm from, right? Hallelujah. He said, I will be known as Brother Jazz from Ogden. Come on, somebody. Uh-huh. Right? But he comes into our life and he gives us, he, he, he takes away those things. And so here Paul is communicating, he's communicating that now that we've been saved, we need to know how to live in the ultimate joy in living for Christ. See, over, over, overall, Paul encouraged the Philippians. It was a word of encouragement. It wasn't, he wasn't rebuking them. He wasn't correcting them like he did in other letters. But he was encouraging the Philippians to press on in their relationship with Christ. Uh, and the biggest encouragement that he was giving them was he was encouraging them to grow. Moses said, let my people go. I pray, let God's people grow. He, he encouraged them throughout the book of, Philippian, of, of, of Philippians to grow in their unity. How many know God is not, a, the enemy is not afraid of a big church. He's afraid of a unified church. How many know that the blessing that you want to see in your life, the, the big things that you want to do in life will never come unless unity is around. Unity, not just in a church house, but unity in your house, unity in your marriage, unity with your children, unity with your grandchildren. How many know unity is a beautiful feeling? And wherever there is unity, right, there the presence of the Lord commands his blessing. Psalms 133. He commands his blessing. Is it coincidence that that is what the devil hits the hardest? He hits the marriages? Because he doesn't want there to be no unity amongst the marriages. And he's real creepy and crafty at how he does it. If he can't get to the man, he hits the woman full-fledged. Getting her to get distorted or get twisted in her emotions or get proud and arrogant and block her growth. Hindering, becoming a hindrance to the husband. But don't get it twisted. Men do that too. Some men act like women. I know. I got to be careful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me retract. I retracted that. I'm sorry. I don't want to offend nobody. I'm not trying to disrespect nobody. But I'm trying to tell you, men, that God wants you to be strong. God wants you to be strong so you lead your families with strength. So you lead your families with anointing. So you lead your marriages with the power of God. God can do nothing with a runner. See, us as men, some of us, we became good runners. We ran from everything, and that's why many of us, that's why our women are stronger. Because they stick it out. They sit there with the kids while we're doing time in jail. They sit there, man, becoming both mom and dad. They go to work. They hold down jobs. They pay bills. Man, I'm admired at Sister Aurora. I mean, women like Sister Aurora, Sister Lydia, Sister Orlinda. I admire these women, and I got to let you guys know that you guys do not go unnoticed. Not only are they serving God, not only are they here in the house of God, but they are toiling twice as hard. And it, it, it blows my mind when I see them also sacrificing to God because they want God's blessing in their lives. But I admire how they take care of their children, how they bring them to church, how they take them to football practice, they take them to baseball practice, they take them to their games, and they're there cheering them on. They come to church. And they're involved in ministry, man. I admire their strength. And I watch their kids, man. Man, I, I, I rarely see, rarely do I see Adam I, and Josiah with some shot eye haircuts. It's looking a little scruffy right now, but mama's going to take care of that. Don't trip. If mama don't take care of it, brother Lou will. Huh? I don't see them go without. I see them blessed, man. I see them blessed all the time. Those things are noticed. But the reality of it is, 
is that they have become that strong because the men in their lives ran from responsibility. Is that okay if I say that? I mean, it's the truth that everyone knows, right? Same thing with us. Some of us men, we're runners. We don't stick around for nothing. And we wonder why it feels as if the wife is running our home. Why? Because they're, in, in a sense, she's a little stronger. She's a little stronger. I remember dealing with that with my wife. I had not, I've not, I had not been good. I wasn't good at being a dad. I wasn't good at being a husband. I, I wasn't good at being there in the house and being a provider, man. I wasn't good at any of that. The moment things got hard, I ran. No, no, I didn't physically run. But running to drugs was running. Uh, running to another woman was running. Uh, getting going to jail was running. And she would stay there picking up the pieces, finding ways to bring money into the house, uh, finding ways to get to work, uh, to buy my kids clothes uh, and buy my kids their everything that they needed, take them to school and wake up early, create a schedule, be there with them when they're sick, uh, wipe their sliveling, sliveling noses, not go, to, not go to sleep that night, but still find a way to get up and go to work. See, this is why it's important that you and I understand that we got to stop being runners in the house of God. We got to learn how to stick things out. We got to learn how to wait on God. We got to run, learn not to run. And when it gets hard, just stay still. The Bible says when you can't go on no more, no longer, all you got to do is stand. Just take a stand. You used to take a stand when there was a barrel of a gun facing at you. You used to stand your ground. Hey, do what you got to do, homeboy. But I ain't going nowhere. What about now when the devil got you on the run because he's pointing a gun at you? What are you going to do? You need to learn to stand your ground. I don't know who that was for here today. But the house of God needs strong men. Men that know how to shift the atmospheres in their life. Shift the atmosphere in their home. Shift the atmosphere in their marriage. Thank God that the Lord has been helping me to grow and to develop when I can, now I can identify. And I know that I know that I know when it's the devil at my tail. And I know when the devil's messing with my wife. And I can now detect when the devil's messing with my children. And instead of sitting there scolding them or speaking death over them, man, I just shut up, man. And I get into my prayer closet and I start talking to the one that's messing with them. Man, you need to know that you have authority in your life. It is not for you to be silent, but it's you for it's you. It's meant for you to get spiritual. It's meant for you to get prophetic. You see, those type of things happen so you can learn how to fight. Because it's when you learn how to fight, it starts, it's when you learn how to fight this fight that, that the odds are greater than even. Does the Bible say, does the Bible not say greater is he that liveth in me? Greater is he that liveth in me than, greater is he that liveth in me than he that is. You know, every single day I always thank God for his death. Resurrection and ascension. Why? Because his death paid the price for me. His pe the Bible says in Galatians 3.13 that Jesus became a curse. He became a curse to break every curse brought forth by the law. The reason why some of us are experiencing some, thing, some things in our life or the reason why some of us have experienced some things in our life because there were active generational curses in our life. But when Jesus came in with his power and might, and we begin to recognize the power of his death, and what exchange was made, what blood exchange was made, how he paid our ransom by his blood. You see, I always thank God for dying for me, for shedding his blood for me. Why? Because as I thank him, I'm also reminding the devil, devil, I already know. 
devil, I know that I know that I know that you have no dominion over me. I know that I know that I know that you can overcome me for greater is he that liveth in me than he that is in this world. I know that I know that I know that you have no authority over my marriage. I know that I know that I know that you have no authority over my children. I know that I know that I know that you have no authority over my ministry. I know that I know that I know that you have no authority over God's house. And it's a one, two, three. That's a one. Bam, that's just a primer, getting them ready. Then here comes, here comes two, the right cross, right? And what is that? Thank you, Jesus, that you resurrected for me. Because if he would have just died alone, he wouldn't have risen in all authority. But he rose in all authority, having authority over all created beings. Having all authority on heaven and on earth and beneath the earth. Having authority over absolutely everything. You want to know why that's good news? Because there was something that was, a, that was some, there was something that had a hold on you. Well, guess what? Jesus has more authority than that. That's right. Jesus has more authority than Satan. Jesus has more authority than Behometh. Jesus has more authority than Jezebel. Jesus has more authority than Leviathan. Jesus has more authority than principalities. Jesus has more authority than powers. Jesus has more authority than tr the thrones. Uh, Jesus has more authority than fallen angels. Jesus has more authority than evil spirits. Uh, Jesus has more authority than unclean spirits. Uh, Jesus has more authority than demons. Uh, that's right. Jesus uh, has more authority. So as I'm laying down that foundation, he realizes, oh, he's one who knows. Then I go around singing that song. I'm the one who really, no, I'm just kidding. Hey, I always do that during a serious moment. I'm sorry, guys. You guys remember that Bretton Woods song? I'm the one who knows. But Jesus is the lover of my soul. He says, press on in their relationship with Christ and to grow in unity, grow in humility. And then I always say, thank God for, res for ascending. For because you ascended, you sit at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. So if the devil ever comes, the, the, the devil or a demon or a lying spirit ever comes and says to you, nobody loves you, nobody cares about you, nobody even prays for you, well, guess what? If absolutely nobody on this earth prays for you, Jesus does. And I'm a firm believer that his prayers matter. So he's interceding for us. You know what he's doing? He's telling the father, hey, look, because the Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of the father. He's saying, hey, look, father. And there's two and one, there, there's three and one, right? He said, hey, look, father, look at that one. Look at how he's really wanting to serve you. Look at how she's really wanting to serve you. Look at all the odds that are against him. Look at all the odds that are against her. Look at how the, man, the, the devil's been trying to torment him. The devil's been trying to get him to, to leave the church. The devil's been trying to get him to leave you. The devil's been trying to get him to get them to stop praying. The devil's been trying to get him to get them to stop giving. The devil's been trying everything. But look, uh, look at God. Uh, they're still calling upon your name. Uh, they're still calling upon me. Uh, look at God. Uh, and what does God do? Uh, he sends his spirit. Spirit, uh, and upon his sending his spirit, he also sends ministering angels uh, to our aid. Uh, listen, I need you to know that we are not alone uh, in this fight. So that's just my primer. When I'm praying, I'm establishing a foundation of truth within my prayer. The atmosphere begins to shift because I'm speaking about atmospheres. The atmosphere begins to shift. And I have a few more minutes. Because my alarm rang. It's only a 30 minute alarm. So I should put it like two hours. I'm <laughs> just playing. I want to give you time to, to I want to give you time to make this altar call. You see, we're called to be atmosphere shifters. If you're a man in the house of God, God has called you to be an atmosphere shifter. To you to be the priest of your home. If you're a single woman in the house of God or husband's not in the picture, listen, that don't mean you don't got authority. You have authority, right? And according to biblical standards, right, 
you submitting yourself to the authority of the house gives you authority. You understand? So when, as we're teaching you biblical principles, as you're learning biblical principles, right, and you're doing the things that you're doing, some, a lot of you guys are doing, you're putting yourself under the authority of the house. So as you're doing that, under the authority of the leadership, the pastor, the pastor's wife, leaders, you're, 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 putting your, you're, you're abiding by biblical requirements that gives authority over to you and your house too. So you're covered as well. Can I, that's a good place to say amen. But if you're a man in the house, you're meant to be strong. You're meant, you're, you're a warrior. There's a warrior in you. You're, there's a roaring lion inside of you. I don't see no weak men here, man. I don't see no sissies. I don't see no chavalas. I see straight, ferocious men of God. Man, I, I, I'm not going to compare myself to David, but if there's anything I can compare to is when David, the Bible says that the discontented came to him in the cave of Adulam, and the book of Chronicles communicates that as he came out of the cave and seen these men that were climbing, that were climbing the mountain, he says he looked upon them, and their faces looked like the faces of lion and lions, and they were swift as gazelles. It meant, it meant that they had a warrior-like look on them. It meant that they were swift. They weren't weak and wobbly men. They were fierce warriors that God had brought to the house of God to effectively take the territory for Jesus and that is the same thing that God has done in this house as I look at you I see fierce warriors I see the faces of lions I see swiftness of gazelles I see accuracy you are here by divine design and divine appointment by God But if you study Jewish culture, the women were warriors too. Come on, women. The, they were instructed. Listen to me. One of the laws, the 600, one of, amongst the 600 plus laws that they had, one of the laws was that women were not allowed to be afraid. They were instructed to never be fearful. That's warrior talk. See that? That's war talk from a warrior God. Because God is a warrior. He is a mighty warrior who fights our battles. So they were instructed. You're in covenant with, with, the, with the great Yahweh. We're in covenant with Jesus. We are not to be fearful. Because they were instructed that, and I would give you the scriptural reference point, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Is that okay? But if you look it up, you're going to find it. All right? I know sometimes I get a little ahead of myself, and I'll even give you the wrong scripture reference. Look, they taught me to remember the scripture, not the scripture reference. I think it, hey, when the devil came to Jesus, when the devil came to Jesus, Jesus didn't give him the scripture reference. Come on, somebody. Right? When he said, turn that stone into bread, he didn't say, well, Deuteronomy chapter 8 says, heck No. When you're in the middle of it, sometimes you don't even remember the whole verse, man. You just remember a little bit of it. Can I get a witness? Hey, but that's enough. Jesus didn't quote the whole scripture. He just says, for it is written, uh, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Right? Well, at least that makes me feel better about not remembering scripture references. Amen. And if you're having a hard time with that, you're not having a hard time with me. You're having a hard time with a common enemy of the Lord, and that is called legalism. That was a chin check. But the reason why was because they would open themselves up to other spirits. Their women were instructed never to be fearful so that a spirit of fear would not come into their lives. And begin to affect them. Because if a spirit of fear inflicted their life, they could no longer be effective in protecting their household while their husbands were at war. Sometimes the men are at war. And the women, you stay behind and you're still taking care of business. 
Sometimes the men are out hitting the streets. Sometimes the men are out laboring, building the house of God. Listen, don't be that fearful one, woman. Don't be that one that gets all afraid. Well, what about this and what about that? Don't open yourself up to those spirits because once they come in, they'll come in flooding and they won't stop coming in and they'll keep on messing with you until your husband gets so weighed down, he gets so weary that he could no longer even stand for himself and your family. Unity. He was saying you got to grow in unity. You got to grow in humility and joy and in peace. Now let me fast forward. Come to the keys. See, unlike many of Paul's letters, Philippians was not written specifically to address church problems or conflicts. Its general tone or feeling is one of gracious affection and appreciation for the congregation. Paul was happy. He was encouraged by the congregation of Philippi. Can I tell you that as a pastor, I'm encouraged by you. And I don't come to you to down you. I come to you to encourage you. I come to you to praise Jesus, but also to give you some praise. Because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. Come on, can you just allow yourself a little, a little compliment right now? I know it gets weird, like, hold on, I'm not used to this. But can I just tell you that? Man, you're, you're an awesome man of God. You're an awesome woman of God. Look at what the Lord has done. God, David's 37 mighty men of war, mighty men of valor. Ain't got nothing uh, on the 37 mighty men of valor in this house. Uh, when I look at you, uh, I don't look at weak and feeble men, uh, but I look at strong men. Uh, I look at men of faith. Uh, I look at men of ferocity. I look at men of tenacity. tenacity. I look at men that don't quit easy. Uh, I look at men that don't rank out for Jesus. That's what I see. He was encouraged. And he was, he was describing to the tone of his letter a gracious affection and appreciation for the congregation. This letter focuses on Christ Jesus as the purpose for living, the source of joy, the hope for eternal life for all who follow him. You see, there were problems and conflicts in the church. Did Jesus not say there would be problems? Luke 17, 1, in the CEV version, just, it's just easy to read. Jesus said to his disciples, there will be something. There will always be something that causes people to sin. But anyone who causes them to sin is in for trouble. A person who causes even one of my little followers to sin. Other translations say, woe is he. Things that cause people to sin are bound to come. In the New King James Version. Troubles will come. But just because they come don't mean that they'll accomplish what they were assigned. There were three things that were going on there. Some were discouraged over Paul's time in prison. It's almost similar to having the founding pastor no longer with them. And there's another leadership that was there tending to the needs of the church, but they longed for the voice and the affection of their founding spiritual father. And so they were discouraged. There was discouragement in the house of God. Then there was tension and disunity between two women in the church. Thank God that don't happen here. There was tension and disunity between two women in the church. And thirdly, and the most troublesome circumstance was that there was constantly false teachers who were coming in and teaching from two extremes. These are the two extremes that the enemy sends his assignments to disrupt the work of God. The first extreme, these false teachers would come in to the church of Philippi and their assignment was to spread legalism amongst the believers who were living by grace. See, legalism by legalist, I mean there were those who claimed that in addition to faith in Christ, people had to follow certain legal requirements in order to gain spiritual salvation. The other, the other extreme was they were, they were preaching or they were teaching from a false place 
because they were libertines. A libertine is a person who is unrestrained morally. And so because they were morally unrestrained, they would teach others. They would say, they would say things like, they would say things like, those who believe that since salvation comes by God's grace through faith, we can ignore Christ's moral law. Salvation is by faith. So if you have the faith, but you keep your sin, you're still saved. That's the false teaching that was coming into the church. A another word for libertines was the, anti an the antinomians. And what they were, were they were against the law. So one extreme was to be legalistic and bound by laws. And the other one was to have absolutely no laws. But God says that we got to have a good balance. You see, in connection with these three potential problems, we have Paul's richest teaching about joy in the middle of life's circumstances. Paul is communicating that in order to experience God's peace, in order to experience freedom from anxiety, you and I as believers must fix our minds on the things that are true, noble, right, pure. And if you do these things, Paul says, the God of peace will be with you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, again, in the CEV translation, it says, Then because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. And this peace will control the way you think and feel. Another translation says that the peace of God will guard your heart. You see, when it comes down to atmospheres, and I'm done preaching, when it comes down to atmospheres, the number one atmosphere you got to protect is your personal atmosphere. You got to protect yourself, your heart. You got to protect your mind. Because if you're not good, you're not going to be good to no one. So God has to first do a work in your life. Does that make sense? So you got to protect the atmosphere of your life. Now, I got more, but I really don't want to expound on this too much. But I'll share this, that in order to protect the atmosphere or to cultivate an effective and powerful atmosphere in your life, in your personal life, you must learn to secure your home. Now by home, I mean you. The Bible references us as houses or as homes. Now like any house, when we come to God, our houses are intruded by thieves. Because the Bible says in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so in our homes, there's no security. There's nothing guarding the doors. There's nothing guarding the windows. There's thieves coming in and out and destroying taking everything of value, taking our dignity, taking our self-respect, taking our love for our, our children, taking our love for our families, our marriages, taking our values and our morals away. And then what do they do? They begin to destroy us. They begin to destroy our walls. They begin to destroy what God has built up. They begin to destroy the body. And then God comes and cleans your house. And when God cleans your house, he also gives us everything we need to be able to guard our homes. See, every house has a thermostat. Somebody say amen. In my house, there's a thermostat. It's a smart thermostat. So I could, I could gauge my thermostat from my phone. And if it's too hot, I can adjust my thermostat and it shifts begins to shift the atmosphere in my home but if I leave windows open and I'm trying to keep the elements out the elements are going to make their way in so no matter how high or how low I turn that thermostat it will not be able to effectively shift that atmosphere so we got to learn how to secure our homes learn how to secure our houses how do we do that? Now, I don't have too much time. I don't have no time to share that because I've preached for already quite some time. But I'll say this. 
elevation, separation is elevation. Look to your neighbor and say, separation is elevation. Now, what would that mean? I'll tell you what that means. When Jesus called his disciples, he called them out of their ordinary lives. He called them out of their whatever condition they were living in. But when he called them out, what did Peter, James, and John have to do? They had to leave everything behind. They left their businesses. They left everything that was familiar. They even left their father there tending to their business. Now some would say, well, that's pretty cold. But you see, the reality of it was is that because they were attached to what was familiar, it had gone them as far as becoming fishermen. But Jesus was giving them an opportunity, an opportunity to separate in order to elevate. And the opportunity of separation was you could stay where you are and keep tending to your nets and keep, keep stay in your business and business as usual. Or you can follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you teachers. I will make you disciples. I will make you apostles. I will make you preachers. I will make you atmosphere shifters. I will make you powerhouses. See, there, one of the, mo the key components about safeguarding your home is separation. You got to separate from all you knew and all you know in order for you to learn new. This is challenging because people that don't do this, their houses are constantly getting contaminated. See, we don't understand the spiritual dynamic fully sometimes. There's some of you that do and some of you that don't. When you're around a certain atmosphere, when you're around a worldly atmosphere, you can only be there for so long. Even me as a pastor, or you could say a spiritual man, there's only a certain amount of time that I could be in a specific atmosphere. If I'm not there preaching, if I'm not there telling about Jesus, if I'm not there doing something for God, I can only spend a certain amount of time there before the atmosphere there begins to affect my life. Are you following? Sometimes we have a hard time with this. And we don't want to let go. Sometimes we feel like we're being disloyal to the people that we love. But this is not about being loyal to people. This is about being loyal to God. Because God has chosen you. Because God has selected you. Because just like he went around picking Peter, John, James, and all the men that he picked. He went around all over the Salt Lake Valley picking you. He said, yes, I want that one that's in the Ogden County Jail, in the Weber County Jail. I'm going to get that one. Up. Yes, I want that one that's in Alco, Nevada, but I'm going to bring them and I'm going to raise them up. Yes, I want that one from Oxnard, California, but I got a work that I want to do in his life. Look at that one from Salt Lake. He may be in prison right now, but I'm going to get him out and I'm going to do a work in his life. He wants to break things out of our life. But in order for you to walk in the fullness and in the newness that God has for you, you got to follow God wholeheartedly and say, God, I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. You want me to separate for a season? I'm going to tell you right now. The separation part, portion of it, it's challenging. It's hard. But let me encourage you and tell you that if you do it, you're going to be more effective in reaching your loved ones. You're no good to them if you don't grow. I'm speaking truth to you right now. You're no good to them unless you grow. Because unless you're spiritually strong, unless you're spiritually fit, and you're ready to engage in some real warfare... My friend, you're going to try to do it in a premature time. And what's going to happen is the results are going to be detrimental to you and to your walk with God. We have to grow. We got to develop. There has to be a little bit. Say it with me, a little bit. A lot of bit of trust to God and a little bit of trust to man. But today, before we close, 
I want to do something very special. I know that there are some of you here today that you may have walked in here for the very first time or you're here, you're here coming back. You've been here, you haven't been here in a while. I need you to know that God wants to do something special in your life. God wants to do something right now. Say it with me, right now. Not tomorrow or not when you leave or not after time. No, God can do something right now. Listen, I don't know what you need. There are some of you that maybe you're discouraged. There are some of you that maybe your houses are in disunity. Well, God can give you the strength and the power and the right knowledge to help you to bring unity into your home. To help you to bring unity into your marriage. There are some of you here today, you may need something from God. Some, you may need a physical healing. Well, I want you to know that God wants to do whatever you are in need of here today. Are you following me here today? Now, I know I didn't touch up too much on the atmospheres. But can I, is it okay to say to be continued? Because I really feel that this is a, a key topic for us. But I want to have an altar call today. Now, first and foremost, I talked about the Jesus that is able to lead us into ultimate joy. If there's anybody here today that you say, I don't know Jesus. I don't have him in my life. I still got other things going on in my life, but I want them gone. Jesus is the only one that can knock them out of your life. You may be saying, well, can Jesus do it from my chair? Sure he can, but he needs a public confession from you. You see, we weren't afraid to publicly confess things. When we were serving the devil, uh, some of you guys are like, I never served the devil. Shut up. Yes, you did. When we were serving the devil, when we were involved in gangs, when we were involved in numbers and in colors and in drugs and in drug distribution and in mafias, what were we doing? We were rep That's the demonic kingdom. We were serving Satan. Huh? We weren't afraid of public confession. That's why we had tattoos. That's why we wore certain colors. That's why we wore certain numbers. We gave public confessions when it came down to serving the devil. And so what does God require from us? A public confession from us. Because if we publicly confess us, he will publicly confess he, us. To, if we publicly confess him, he will publicly confess us before his father. So is there anybody here that you say, I'm ready to make a public confession. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I just want you to lift your hand.